This is Alaska's People, the award-winning statewide television magazine covering the issues and people of our state. Naomi Yoramuro's historic adventure began on Thursday, January 26, when he flew to the Kahiltna Glacier on the west side of Mount McKinley. It was here at the 7,200 foot level that he established his base camp. For the next six days, he acclimated himself to his new environment. <sighs> he also tested the equipment which his life would depend on, equipment like ice crampons, a compass, a CB radio, and ice screws. Yoramuro also took time out for an interview with TV Asahi of Tokyo. Speaking to an interpreter, he said, I have to return for my wife and friend. I have to, I have to return. On Wednesday, February 1st, Yurimura began the long walk to the 20,320-foot summit of Denali. This is the West Buttress route, and it's considered the easiest way to the top. However, no one has done it alone in the wintertime, but experts agreed that if anyone could do it, Yurimura could. In Japan, he is known as the animal for the toughness he has displayed on his many adventures. In the summer of 1970, he completed the first solo ascent of McKinley. Two years later, he mushed a dog team across the North Pole from Greenland to Kotzebue. He has climbed the tallest mountains on six continents, including the highest, Mount Everest. And his adventures are documented in books, which are studied in Japanese grade schools. So some felt this was just a routine adventure for the Japanese climber. Yorimura pulled a sled behind him for part of the way with his backpack, which had enough food and fuel for two weeks. He also had two long bamboo poles strapped to his sides, which he hoped would save him if he fell into a crevasse. He also carried a ski pole and a slimmer bamboo pole, which he used to probe for possible traps in the ice. At nighttime, he slept in man-made igloos and enjoyed a menu consisting of raw caribou meat, whale blubber, seal oil, and some fruits. Naomi celebrated his 43rd birthday in style on Sunday, February 12th, when at 6.50 p.m. he made history. The following morning at 11 a.m., he radioed the TV crew who were flying above the mountain. The clouds prevented them from seeing him. However, Yuramura told them of his achievement and said he would return to the base camp on Tuesday the 14th at 5 p.m. Then pilot Lowell Thomas Jr. spoke to Yuramura. Again, uh, congratulations on making the first solo winter ascent of Mount McKinley. That's a tremendous... Uh, a tremendous undertaking. This was the last radio contact anyone had with Yoramura. Thomas's associate, Doug Geating, was unable to fly to the mountain because of bad weather on Tuesday. On Wednesday, it was clear, but he saw no signs of the Japanese climber. Then on Thursday, February 16th, Geating spotted Yoramura in an ice cave at the 16,000-foot level. He's out waving at me in, in, in our plan language and what we had arranged prior to the, the flying in and out in case of radio failure, which obviously we've had, is that he is okay. This was the last time anyone saw Yoramura alive. Bad weather and poor visibility hampered search efforts. Then on Sunday the 19th, Doug Geating was able to fly American climber Jim Wickwire to the base camp where he joined TV producer climber Iho Otani. The following day was a perfectly clear one, and for the first time, the National Park Service joined in the search. Mount McKinley's chief mountaineering ranger, Bob Gerhardt, flew in a high-altitude helicopter to the mountain and landed on three different levels. He also dropped off the two climbers, Wickwire and Otani, on the 14,000-foot level, there they began their own ground search. Officials believe that if Yoramura was healthy, he would have climbed down the mountain on this day. However, he didn't. On Wednesday, February 22nd, Gerhard made an official statement. It is now in the sixth day since that sighting, and we believe the odds are extremely slim that Mr. Yoramura has survived. We are continuing the search as weather allows because of his past proven exceptional survival skills. Within the next few hours, officials from TV Asahi were beaming back pictures to Tokyo over the satellite. According to foreign news correspondent Sam Samajina, the story of Yoramura is important to all of Japan because he is more than just a climber, he is... Japanese's biggest hero. On Friday the 24th, a group of young climbers from Naomi's alma mater, Meiji University of Tokyo, arrived in Anchorage and began preparing for their own search. They were confident he was still alive and even had a birthday cake for him. Meanwhile, on Sunday, Jim Wickwire and Io Otani, exhausted and slightly frostbitten, returned to Talkeetna and spoke to the press. My opinion is that he fell, that he fell down, yes. There is no possibility for his survival. From afar, Denali, which is Athabascan Indian for the Great One, stands majestically. But unseen to the eye are the vicious winds which buffet its slopes and the temperatures which have been recorded as cold as minus 148 degrees. Naomi Yoramura challenged nature and for a while won. But in the end, Denali claimed its 38th victim. While Japan mourns his apparent death, they can take comfort in the words written by Joe Wilcox, who survived a tragedy on the mountain in 1967. He wrote, 
In climbing beyond the realm of mortality, there is no disgrace in defeat. In the winds of space, there is no dishonor in death. For Alaska's people, I'm Mark O'Brien. Yeah,